distinguished ladies and gentlemen, technical team, hello, please can we settle in very quickly? This meeting is scheduled for 12 o'clock, it's slightly beyond 12 now. Let's settle in very quickly. Thank you. Technical team. Hello. Please, can we settle in very quickly? This meeting is scheduled for 12 o'clock. It's slightly beyond 12 now. Let's settle in very quickly. Thank you. Good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. May I, on behalf of the founder of this university, Ariafe Babalola, his wife and the leadership of our university welcome all of you to this all-important meeting this afternoon. Indeed, this is one of the beautiful and fantastic ways to start the new year. For the commencement of this meeting this afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, may we be upstanding so Hello. that we can have the university anthem. Please, can we set you in very quickly? The anthem. Please, can we set you in very quickly? Technical team, please. Or should we render it ourselves? Can we have it on our own? One, two, go. Ah, but we come. Oh, oh, ah, but we come. Oh, oh, oh ah, but we come. Funded by a fan, Baba Lola, a believer in industry and determination. Set 
technical team, please. We got Can we have it on our own? One, two, go. Ah, but team, please. Meeting this afternoon. This For the commencement of this meeting this afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, may we be upstanding to so have happy university anthem. Please, can we set you in very quickly? Should we render it ourselves? Thank you. Ah, I wish you had rendered the other parts of the anthem the way you rendered the last three sentences. Can we have it on our own? All the same. One, Thank you. two, go. Technical team, ah, are you ready for DUT anthem? Okay, thank you. Since we have only one person from <clears throat> our sister university here, is taken to be rendered. Thank you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I, on behalf of the founder, welcome all of us most heartily to this meeting. You know as much as I do that these are the days of collaboration. The days of competition have yielded way to collaboration. Equally, you know as much as I do that we tend to benefit more, we tend to gain more by collaborating with one another, with each other as the case may be, rather than doing it on our own. It is for this reason, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, that we have in our midst this afternoon a thoroughbred academic, a highly cerebral teacher, a friend, a sister, Dr. M.M. M. Amwana. When the time comes, she will be properly introduced. But let me start by introducing our leaders in the house this afternoon. The first person I want to present to our sister from South Africa, from the name, I'm tempted to want to believe that she's thoroughly Nigerian, M.M. M. The first person I want to introduce to you is our leader in this community, the founder of our university. Even though he's here in a representative capacity, ladies and gentlemen, our sister, I present to you our founder in absentia, Are Afebabalola. I said a short while ago that the leader is here in a representative capacity. He is being represented by his wife, our mother in this community, the Chief Executive of South Abu Adventures, the thoroughly distinguished Yare Muduke Barla. We welcome you, ma'am. <clears throat> we have in the house somebody you have been interfacing with since you came yesterday, a Vice Chancellor Professor Smaranda Olaride. I'm sure beyond Abu Ad, beyond Nigeria, you are likely to have met her, or you will likely meet her shortly after now in her capacity as a board member of AAU. When I say AAU, I don't mean Adekule Ajashi University, I mean Association of Africa University. You are welcome, Prof. We have in the house our Deputy Vice Chancellor and Station Professor Sylvester Ujo. Chief Administrative Officer of the University is right here with us. I'm talking about the Registrar, Lady Christy Oluborodi. I saw the Borsa a short while ago. I guess he's still around. Whether I see you or not, I, I present you to the house. The Borsa of the University, Pastor Madupe Balala, we appreciate you. 
we have in the house this afternoon to receive you our sister from South Africa, the University Liberian, Mrs. Rosalind Zubar. To receive you and share the joy of this moment with you, we have a battalion of our provost in the house, starting from the man directly in front of me. The provost, College of Postgraduate Studies, Professor Abu Wahab Yuan. I present to you a friend from South Africa, the provost of the best law college in West Africa. We didn't say that. The regulatory authorities said so, AUC. I present to you the provost college of law, Professor Tunde ABC. I don't want to preempt the vice chancellor. I want to present to you the Provost College of Medicine and Health Sciences, Professor Laufel Gudikwe. My colleague, brother and friend, the Provost College of Engineering, Professor Joseph Dada, FNSC. The Provost College of Social Management Sciences, Professor Abio Assis. Adimola Assis. His colleague in the College of Sciences, Dr. Ulua Sheyad. How do I introduce you? I call her Professor OFR, MFR. Professor MFR. Okay, Professor Mbang Femi Uyiwo, MFR, MFU. And of course, she has the national honor of MFR. We appreciate you, ma'am. And our other leaders in the house, I can see the director of audit. We welcome you most heartily. This man wears a very important crown in this university, the chairman of PTCF, Dr. Shukbo Ijabadini Yi. And all our teachers and workers in the house, we treasure you. Oh, my friend, I can see you even though you are hiding. The immediate past Provost College of Sciences, the man who has everything but one, I won't mention what you don't have today. Professor Abiyo Dojo, we appreciate you. All our friends, brothers and sisters in the house, particularly Abua students, great Abua students. Head down now. Great Abua students, we appreciate you. God bless you. I think I should say a word or two about our guest speaker today. At the appropriate time, he will be properly introduced. But the purpose of this moment, it is a gentleman we have in the house, a friend, sister, a thoroughbred academic, Highly cerebral teacher, Dr. M.M. and Wana, the research coordinator of Dubai University of Technology, South Africa. We appreciate you, man. You're welcome. From the crystal ball in front of me, man, which is not obvious to any other person in the house to see, I'm tempted to want to believe that we are likely to drink copiously from your fountain of knowledge and experience this afternoon. Am I speaking your mind? Thank you very much, man. Having done this distinguished ladies and gentlemen, welcome with me to this side of the arena, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Sparanda Olanide, to welcome our August visitor. Thank you, ma'am. Great Abwad students, I, I can't hear you. Are you in the hall? Great Abwad engineering students, 
That's good. Great award law student. Great award College of Medicine student. Great SMS student. Great postgraduate student. The engineering will have it today. On this note, I want to remind all of us, today is an order epoch-making event. And this time around, <coughs> it's not an epoch-making event only for Abwad, but for two sisters universities. Two sisters universities from the great African continent. That is our university, Afeba Balola University, your university, my students, and the Durban University of Technology, South Africa. Let's give a round of applause. This is unique. This is indeed international. We are here to celebrate. We are here to add and improve capacity. We are here to show the whole world that Africa knows sisterhood. Africa knows brotherhood. And we are here to conquer the world. Please permit me briefly to recognize the presence of our funder in absentia. He sends you greetings. He loves you all. He will have wanted to be here, but due to his very busy schedule, he could not make it. Give him a round of applause. We owe what we are today to one dream. One man, who I was called one man, to one great man, Are Afe Emmanuel Babalola. Let us recognize him in absentia. He made it happen once again, this time beyond the shores of our nation, international recognition. Yeyare, our beloved Mother General, as we call her. Even though I want to let you know, he never comes without Are Afe Babalola himself. Today she is here. We appreciate you, ma'am. Give him, give her a round of applause. She believes in you. This is the first time in 12 years since I am here that I am seeing Yere Are Modupe Babalola alone here without physical presence of her husband. This is unprecedented. We are grateful, Ma. On this note, our most distinguished friend, sister, visitor, teacher, beloved cerebr cerebral academic, our most loved Dr. M.M. Anwana, I welcome you all. Why? Recognizing and adopting the already existing protocol, it is my absolute delight. and player to welcome our highly cerebral visitor from the Durban University of Technology, the DUT, all the way from South Africa to our university, to Afeba Balola University, Adoekiti, Nigeria, Abwad. This visit is a great honor for us, indeed a great honor. It demonstrates duties on parallel commitment 
to actualize the collaborative aspirations and goals contained in the Memorandum of Understanding between ABWAD and DUT, which was signed at a very warm, unforgettable ceremony, online ceremony, in August 2021. During that online ceremony, I extended an open invitation to my very good friend and colleague, the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the Durban University of Technology, Professor Tandwa Mtembu, for him and the DUT team to visit Abwad and see for themselves our world-class infrastructure and our undoubted credentials as Africa's fastest growing university known for quality and functional education. Even though the Vice Chancellor is not here today, we can feel the hospitality and warmth of DUT through the prolific and amiable coordinator of our of research coordinator of DUT in our guest speaker of today, who is Dr. M.M. Anwa. Anwana, you are most welcome. Let us give her another round of applause. He's here because of you. He's here to make us better. She's here to further strengthen Africa's collaboration in research and development. We thank you, ma'am. You're most welcome. It, we very much look forward for your presentation, ma'am, and to benefiting from your enormous wealth of experience as a former scholar in business law, co corporate governance, and sustainable development. In addition to her lecture, this visit provides a timely, important opportunity for us to further explore areas of mutual collaboration between our institutions, most especially with respect to students' recruitment, research, linkages, and strategic partnership. That is why we are here. Here at Abwad, we cherish international collaborations in research, science, and innovation with top-tier institutions of the world, of which DUT is undoubtedly one. Like your university, ma'am, our vision at Abwad is to achieve the highest standards of excellence in societally relevant research, innovation, and enterprise development, and to become one of the world's top tier research intensive universities. We have the same vision and mission. DUT and Abwat share a number of striking similarities in our visions, missions, and commitment to societal development. In just less than 20 years of existence, Doba University of Technology has grown astronomically to become ranked as one of the most prestigious universities in South Africa, and in Africa indeed. Give DUT a resounding round of applause. It is not easy. It takes a lot to do that and to achieve that. This is exactly the feat that Abwad has also achieved in just about 12 years of our own existence. We celebrated our 12th year recently on the 4th of January, 2022. We are also very young. But the young shall grow and shall be better than the aged ones. Here we are, 
living by example and leading by example. Just within 12 years, Abwad has already won several national and international awards and recognitions as the home of quality education, scientific innovation, and social transformation. Some of the leading research works done at Abwad in area of vaccine and drug production, healthcare, agriculture, information technology, and entrepreneurship have changed the world. Much more than one could ever expect from a relatively young university. For instance, very recently, our institution received the approval of the National Agency for Food Administration and Control, NAFTAC, for our homegrown um, upward viri virudicine liquid, a herbal drug to combat COVID-19 and other viral infections. You can imagine, my student, what this is. My researchers here, they know how much we have tried since February 2019. The moment the problem of COVID-19 arose, our funder, visionary, great visionary funder, immediately set in motion a team of researchers to look into this deadly virus. And here are, we are today. We are proud of our researchers. Similarly, the Abuad Multisystem Hospital has recorded several successful path-breaking surgical procedures that are changing the face of healthcare delivery in this continent, not only in Nigeria. Also, the Abuad Farm is playing an important role in agricultural development, food security, and agri-technology in Adoikiti and beyond. Not to mention our important role in youth training in agri-business. The Abbott Planetarium is providing inestimable opportunities for our academic community, for our students, to explore space innovation and space technology concept. I want to let you know that when I ask our very delightful visitor, have you ever been into the space, into the universe, through planetarium? She said that she's looking forward for the visit, for the universe, visiting to the universe this evening at our planetarium. This is your university, my students. University where you all have it ready. We hope you find time, that is this evening, to visit, to explore this world infrastructures. Planetarium is for today, this evening. The time today is for our seminar, for our lecturer to take us through a very interesting topic. And on behalf of our eminent, charismatic, and austere Astute Chancellor, our funder, the president of Afe Babalola University, Are Afe Babalola, OFR, CON, SAN, LLD, DLIT, and many, many, as well as members of senior management team of the university and the entire community, Abbott community, I must warmly welcome you to Afeba Balola University. And I hope you have a memorable and productive time here with us at Abuad. You are warmly welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice Chancellor. Please, can we celebrate her a little bit more?
Thank you. Our sister and friend from South Africa, EU2 specifically, when the VC was presenting a welcome address, I noticed something of significant importance that our two universities, Abuad and DUT, have a common ground, or have common ground in so many areas. I will mention just a few. These are two universities making exploits, calling the shots, and leading others, including those that are several decades older than the two of them. Abuad is 12 years. Your university is 20. We know the ranking and the ratio of your university in South Africa, one, and in Africa as a whole. We know who and what we are, despite the fact that we are just 12 years. We are a clear leader in this part of the world. Shall we celebrate ourselves, distinguished ladies and gentlemen? We are here to learn at the feet of this erudite scholar. That is the whole essence of our being here this afternoon. But before our presentation, let me call my colleague, friend, and brother, Dr. Ifeba Mdile, to please say a word or two about our guest speaker this afternoon. Shall we celebrate, my friend? Thank you. May I please ask that the seminar presenter, Dr. M.M. Awana from the Dublin University of Technology, please rise. Thank you. Please rise, ma. I just want to say a brief thank you. Uh, although she has asked that it should be succinct and short so that we can get straight into the lecture, Dr. M. M. Anwana is the research coordinator of the Durban University of Technology. She is a barrister, solicitor, and lecturer at the DUT. She is a scholar in the field of company law, corporate governance, and other areas of law. She has over three decades experience in law and research. She has an LLB, an LLM, a PhD, and she is a Nigerian and has pivoted the relationship between Durban University of Technology and the Afe Babalola University. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome with me, Dr. M.M. Awana. Thank you. Let me lower the microphone a little bit uh, for the deficiency, <laughs> the height deficiency. Don't know about this one, I'll not touch it. Um, wow, I don't know where to start, but just to say that I feel very much at home. From yesterday when I arrived, the reception has been incredible. I have sent a um, message back to the people at home in South Africa to tell them how very, very impressed and how welcome I have felt. So I just want to say to everybody in Abuat, thank you so much for this very warm reception that I've received since yesterday. And uh, I just want to um, recognize the protocol by firstly recognizing the wife of the founder. She received me yesterday as well in her business premises. And also for the first time, as I hear, she has come to be here without her husband because of me. So I feel very, very honored. And I want to say thank you so much, ma'am. And thank you for that honor and privilege that you have given to me. 
And I also want to extend my very warm, sincere appreciation to your Vice Chancellor. I do not know the words to describe you, other to say that you are indeed a friend already, you are a sister, and you are a mentor. I hope to learn a lot from you on this academic visit. Thank you so much for steering the will of this very, very prestigious institution. Your students' first impression about them is that I can see discipline and I can see pride for their institution. So very big well done, Professor, for your work in this institution. And I want to observe all other protocols, the registrar of the university. It was my delight to meet you yesterday and again today. And the librarian, which is the foundation of research. Without a functional library, there can be no research. So thank you so much for keeping that feat. And my greatest pleasure is that you're all women. If you read all the further my um, biography, I am all for women. So well done, and well done to the men that has also kind of given you grounds and supported you to move this institution forward. And I want to recognize my colleagues, the provost, um, and the heads of departments that are here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your time. And we hope to further take this engagement further into the realms that even we never imagined. And I believe that this is just a stepping stone to that, and that this um, engagement between the Afe Balalola University, Adoikiti, Nigeria, and the Durban University of Technology in South Africa will be able to achieve that. Thank you so much. Um, before I start, I just want to um, bring greetings from KwaZulu-Natal, which is the province in the east of South Africa. We call it the East Coast. And um, Durban, the city of Durban, which is a uh, former capital of that province, but it, the province has, the capital has since moved to Peter Marisburg, which we also have DUT there as a campus in that, in Peter Marisburg. I want to um, greet you uh, from, uh, I will send, bring greetings to you from our Vice Chancellor, as has been mentioned, Professor Tandwa Ntembu. Um, we did have an online engagement whereby some of the students were able to meet him, but he is a pan-Africanist, and it is his vision that it is time now for Africa to begin to engage themselves. It is time now for Africa and African young people to begin to cross those boundaries that have been set up and to begin to see yourselves as one, as fighting the same cause, and to uh, erase all the barriers that have made this impossible or difficult through the, uh, through the decades of African independence. So we are moving into a new era now where the young people of Africa will begin to engage themselves in research, begin to engage themselves in technology, and begin to see themselves as one, and more importantly, begin to know that there is nothing that is impossible when you are ready to, um, to climb that mountain. I also bring you greetings from our Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, Innovation, and Engagement. She's also a woman par excellence. She is the one that can be credited for where Durban University of Technology is at the moment in terms of our world ranking. I also bring you greetings from my dean, the Faculty of Management Sciences, Professor Fulu Netswera, who himself, when I showed him the pictures from yesterday, told me that he's going to be on the next flight here. But I told him to wait, let me finish mine, and then he can come and do his. <laughs> Thank you so much. So having said that, I want to also acknowledge Ekiti State, because I believe that if Ekiti State did not provide the enabling environment, I don't think the Afe Balalola University would have been as successful. So I want to thank the Ekiti State government management and the local government administrators for making this possible. Thank you so much, Ekiti State. And another feat about Ekiti State is that it is one of the smallest states in Nigeria but it's got most of the professors per capita in Nigeria. For such a small state, 
I think that is a great achievement. And I believe that that is probably one of the reasons why this university has flourished the way it has flourished in such a short time. So for those who are from this state, I greet you. For those who are from other states, I greet you as well. We are all Africans. Thank you very much. Um, just to tell you a little bit about the Durban University of which I come from, um, we are a young but also a very old institution. Durban University of Technology arose from a merger with previous segregated institutions in South Africa. So if you know the history of South Africa, you know about the apartheid time where black institutions were segregated from white institutions and Indian institutions, etc. So when the uh, government, when the apartheid was abolished in 1994, um, mergers of universities started. And Durban University is one of those universities that was merged between those different universities that were set up for different racial classifications. They were merged together. Initially, we were called the Durban Institute of Technology. That was in 2002. And then in 2007, we became the Durban University of Technology. From that time onwards, the Durban University of Technology has taken research as its foundation. We believe that without research, there is no need for a higher institution, especially in Africa. Because Africa, the time has come for us to begin to develop our research capability and capacity. I am so happy to hear from the Vice Chancellor about the feat that Abwad, in its short existence, has achieved, especially in bringing about a herbal remedy for the COVID-19 pandemic and other pandemics that are likely to come in future. Well done to the medical college and the research unit of Abwad. May we give a, a clap to this. I believe that there are many, very many things that DUT will also learn from Abwad. And my visit here is just an open door of opportunity for our scholars and researchers to have this platform to exchange and achieve and explore through research, through postgraduate studies, and possibly even into undergraduate studies to be able to, do, um, to, to make this fit possible for um, research in Africa. Now, to the Durban University of Technology as well, we are ranked in the 500 top universities globally. This ranking is from the Times Higher Education World University Ranking. Um, our Deputy Vice Chancellor in, in charge of research took a lot of strategic vision, mission, and strategic thinking to bring us a relatively young university in South Africa to that feat. We are also number five when it comes to the overall universities in South Africa. So if you are familiar with universities in South Africa, we have the University of Cape Town, which is a long established university. We have the universities of Johannesburg, Peter Marysburg, Stellenbosch, uh, Witwatersrand. These are all very long standing institutions. So for us to be number five, relatively young, we feel that that is a great accomplishment on our part. When it comes to the University of Technology, we are number one in South Africa and as well as Africa. When it comes to citation, citation, it means uh, the, 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 the number of cite citations we have received from publishers all over the world. We are number 10 globally. And that is a result of people that have dedicated their time to research people that have dedicated their time to um, exp experimentation and discovering of new knowledge. So I'm leaving that with you here in Afe Balalola University, that students and scholars and academics, you should invest a lot in research, invest through your time, through your energy, it's not easy, but I know that you can do it. And having said that, one of the MOU um, accomplishments that we have accomplished is that we now have about 23 students from Abwad registering with us in the Durban universities to undergo their 
thank you, to undergo their postgraduate studies in the doctoral studies and some in the master's studies. So we are hoping that in the next three years, we might, hopefully coronavirus will, be, will not be still around where these students will be able to come to Durban so that they can walk a stage like this and wear their red and their uh, gowns depending on the qualifications that they are achieving. So having said that, let me not go any further but uh, to go straight to my presentation. So I started off as a lecturer in corporate law. My, um, post, my um, doctoral thesis is also on corporate governance and corporate social responsibility. Why did my interest come here? Because a, um, a lot of people do not really want to do this, uh, to, 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 to get involved in this area. But I come from the Niger Delta region of Nigeria. And, you know, growing up, we had all the problem of um, oil spillage, environmental degradation, environmental devastation. Till today, we're still having it as well. So my interest was in the area of corporate social responsibility. How corporations in Africa can assist the government to restore and to feed back into the socio-economic development of their communities. You know, um, gone are the days where corporations would tell us that their core mission is to generate profit, uh, pay dividend to shareholders, and pay taxes to the government. But as we have seen over the more than 50 years of oil exploration and other exploit, uh, extractive industry all through Africa, gone are those days. So we are saying that now we need to emphasize corporate governance into all our institutions, including institutions of learning here uh, in uh, examples of Abwad. And I'm very happy that when I went around yesterday, I wasn't only looking at the, the structure, the, the, st the infrastructure of Abwad. I was also looking at the environmental impact that Abwad is leaving behind, the environmental footprint. Now we're talking about climate change. I was also looking at also uh, just to see um, what, how Abwad is taking their environment and the issues of climate change. And I'm very pleased to inform you today that I have left with very great impression and understanding that Abwad in all its development is also developing the environment as well. So a very big well done to the founder and visionary of Abwad. Yesterday, I was invited to the medical college to see the facilities. I took some pictures as well. I have sent them back home, and my friends and scholars have sent back to say they cannot believe that this is on our continent. So well done once again to the vision of Abwad to develop such facilities that many Nigerians and Africans would normally go abroad to have such facilities, but it is right here in Adoikiti. So well done to the management of this great institution and the visionary of this great institution for developing all of those things. So students, do not take this for granted, but rather I would like you to emulate this and in your generation to do even greater. Right, so this is me. I originally started from the Applied Law Department of the Durban University of Technology. Thereafter, um, I was called upon to come and head the research unit. So for the past three years, I have been heading research unit, postgraduate research unit, and the entire research of the Faculty of Management Sciences. And that is how this MOU came into existence because I want to not only um, work with the South Africans alone, but to extend it to the whole of Africa. So we've got the same kind of partnership with institutions in Ghana, in um, Uganda, in uh, Nigeria, in Rwanda, and also in Mozambique. And we are not even stopping there. We are continuing until Africa is united through postgraduate studies and research. Thank you so much. All right, so, 
Some facts about Africa. In Africa, we have about 1.3 billion people living on the continent in 52 different countries. And totally, we produce $2.2 trillion in nominal GDP. I looked at the statistics from China. In China, they have about 1.4 billion people, but they produce $4 trillion when it comes to the nominal GDP. So which means that Africa, we have a very long way to go to lift our people out of poverty and to meet the SDGs, the UN SDGs, which is part of my presentation today. In Africa, our GDP is derived mostly from trade, agriculture, and harvesting of various sources of energy and natural resources, such as oil, gas, gold, diamonds, and precious minerals. In Southern Africa, you would see, if you go to the, um, to the mining uh, communities, you will see a lot of devastation as well, left by the mining companies. And you also see, for, you also hear, for example, many deaths, people, the mines collapsing on people, people getting trapped in the mines, dying in the mines, etc. And then these people are exposed themselves to so much risk. But when you go to their living conditions, you find out that there is nothing to, to, talk, to, to write home about. They're living in very poor uh, living conditions, but they are extracting minerals from very dangerous levels underground. And these minerals are mostly by companies who are listed on the London Stock Exchange, on the New York Stock Exchange. They make great profits for their shareholders, but the communities and the environments where these minerals are being extracted from sometimes don't even have good primary schools. They don't even have electricity. They don't even have water. And then uh, we are bringing this to the world to say that a time must come where this must stop, where people who are living in communities where minerals are being extracted from must also benefit from those minerals. So I'm sure you are familiar with pictures like this. This is Ogoni land in, in the community of the Niger Delta region of Nigeria. Oil has been extracted here for almost 50 years going, but the community is suffering from, as you can see, a devastation in the environment, which has prevented them to continue with what they know, which is agriculture and fishing. It has totally destroyed agriculture and fishing in those areas. I'm just going to show you some more pictures. This is in South Africa. This is the mining community, the people that live um, on, the, on the left hand side, I think it's the right one on the screen that you are looking. This is how they live. They live in shackles, in shacks, as they call it. And that is just how it looks like. C uh, children are brought up in this community. And then on my right, I think it's probably your left, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there was, I don't know if you heard about it in 2012, where 48 miners who went on strike, they were striking for better pay and for better recognition of the very dangerous work that they do, they were gone down by the South African police force because the company was losing revenue. So this is what brought me to the issue of corporate social responsibility. And I'm going to have a session with the corporate, uh, sorry, with the, with the law students, those that are offering um, corporate law to, to take this further as a lecture, but today it's, it's a public lecture, so it's for public consumption, so I will not go too deeply into the legal aspects. However, we are calling on companies to ensure corporate responsibilities in their organization. Corporate, corporate responsibility means that you have to be mindful about the environment, you have to be mindful about the community, you have to be mindful about even those that work in your organization, and you have to be mindful about the human resources, even those that are not yet employed in your organization. The picture on the right, my right, is a picture of a world surrounded by healthy living plants. That is the world, that is the picture we are trying to achieve. 
through corporate responsibility and corporate governance. So now I'm going to just briefly uh, talk about the definition of corporate social responsibility. Uh, there have been many definitions and no one has really come to an agreement as to which one should be the one that should be used. However, I have extracted from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development in the United Nations, because these are the ones that are often most cited. So the WBCSD defines it as continuing commitment by business to behave ethically and continue to, so, and continue to, continue to sustainable economic development while improving the quality of life of their employees and their families, as well as local communities and society at large. I want to say that I have been very impressed with Abwad because I came to discover that many of the students in our program are staff of this institution, not only academic staff, but administrative staff. And I believe that, thank you. I believe that this is a sustainable development plan for Abwad because they have recognized that they need to invest in their employees, not just the academic, but also the administrative. The United Nations defines it as the overall contribution of business to sustainable development. So United Nations, even though it's shorter, but it's more broad. So everything that is sustainable, business must be a part of it. Business must contribute to it. Business must literally take ownership of this. And then how can this be done? This can only be done through corporate governance. So there has to be proper gov corporate governance structures in every institution and in every organization in order for us to be able to achieve a sustainable corporate social responsibility and to meet the SDGs, the 17 SDGs in Africa. So what is corporate governance? Corporate governance is the system by which companies are directed and controlled. So I have highlighted several words there, like system. There has to be a system for there to be corporate governance. If you take apart, for example, the vice chancellor, even when she was recognizing, she, she, she noted the structures that are there, as well as the MC, I listened, and that is corporate governance, where you put a system in place where there is a reporting structure, directed and controlled. There has to be a vision for you to direct an entity, an organization to achieve greater good. There must be a directive, a direction, and a group of people that come together to develop that uh, direction for the organization and then control. So other definitions on corporate governance are there. I've extracted three more which you can also take a look at because I will leave this presentation with the office and it can be made available to anyone who would want to be interested in this. And the purpose of corporate governance is to facilitate effective and entrepreneurial and prudent management that can de deliver long-term success. So we have moved away from philanthropic whereby an organization will donate some money to a community or donate computers to a school or whatever, those are not sustainable, they are not long-term. After four years, the computers will pack up, that school will go back to normal. So we want, when you are engaging in corporate social responsibility, to look at it from the premise of sustainability and from the premise of being long-term. And that is when we say that you would be able to, um, to achieve. Why do we need corporate governance? Why do we need corporate social responsibility? The first thing is, I just want to take you back to all the corporate failures that took place, which shook the world, which destroyed individuals and families. Because people that had pensions stored in many of these corporations, one day they woke up and there was no more pension available for them. Imagine we all bank, we all put our monies in the bank, Many of us, when we retire, our savings have been in the bank, or whatever will be given to us will be put into the bank. Imagine waking up and that is all gone. It's devastating. So 
that is why we are saying that corporate governance and corporate social responsibility has to be better enforced, especially in developing countries like Nigeria and South Africa and the African continent. So just to mention a few, we had Enron that collapsed, Tyco, Bearings, The WorldCom, Volkswagen, Pamelat, Lehman Brothers, etc. These shook the world. It impacted on capital markets, which means people's shares were crushed and it affected the society as a whole. We had also the financial sector collapse, the Deutsche Bank, the Merrill Lynch, the Santander's, the JP Morgan, the Commerce Bank, these all went into corporate collapse. So that is why corporate governance and corporate social re responsibility is a very big um, area where research can be carried out, both in Africa and even also internationally. All right. Now, we have lots of legislative framework. Remember, I'm a lawyer of 30 years last year, called to bar. So of course, there's always going to go back to the law. Um, in South Africa, these are the main legislative frameworks governing corporate social responsibility and corporate governance. We have the Constitution of 1996, which contains the Bill of Rights. Which constitution is so valued and so loved by South Africans? because they all sat together and they decided what should be in their constitution. And therefore, they are very happy to be governed by this constitution. And then from the constitution, we have the Companies Act, which regulates all corporate activities. We have the uh, King Report on Corporate Governance for corporate law students. I, I wish you can read these reports. Right now, we have the one of uh, King 4, which says the main features of King 4 is that it should be applicable to all organizations without exemptions. It shouldn't be applicable only to multinationals or um, private companies or public companies. It should be applicable to all organizations, including institutions like this of which we stand today. And then we have these other acts, which you can also read up on. And the best part about it is the last JSC listing rules. So the Johannesburg Stock Exchange has also incorporated the corporate governance and social responsibility into its rules for companies to be listed on the exchange. So these are things that we can take note of in Nigeria and other parts of Africa, and we can also incorporate these as well. Then um, I'm briefly going to, this, to, to look at the Nigerian legislation, uh, governing corporate governance and corporate social responsibility, and that is the Companies and Highlight Matters Act of 2011, Investment and Securities Act, which also incorporates guidelines on whistleblowing in Nigerian banking sector, which is also something that is very useful because it allows members of the public to be engaged in company activities. The Bank and Other Financial Institution Act of 2011, 13, the Insurance Act, and also the listing rules, the Nigerian uh, Stock Exchange also have listing rules which incorporate corporate governance and corporate social responsibility. So in coming together, we feel that we can learn Nigeria and South Africa, the leading economies of the continent can learn a lot from each other in the area of corporate governance and corporate social responsibility. Now let's go to the Sustainable Development Goals. We have 17 of them. And in Africa, all of them are material. All of them are important. We have some countries where some of them are no longer a necessity because they have overcome it. But, we st but in Africa, I don't see anyone that we can leave out. Each and every one of them are very, very important. And we are saying that institutions, through research, inst institutions, through engagements with the community, through corporate social responsibility and good corporate governance structures can tap into any of these uh, SDGs and help to achieve it for their community. I still go back to my visit to the hospital yesterday and in my mind I was like when I went through all the different wards and I saw all the equipment machinery I was this is corporate social responsibility in action. I was also told that most of these treatments have been subsidized by the founder of this institution. 
And I wish I could, I'm going to meet him today, uh, hopefully. If not, I know I will meet him before I leave. But because I want to say to him, thank you very much, sir, for your corporate social responsibility footprint in Africa. Because I know that, uh, as I was told in the hospital, that people come from all over the country for the dialysis treatment. They come from all over the country for the um, surgeries. And I know that he probably did it without thinking about it, without thinking about the footprint that he has left. But it was amazing. And I spent the whole two hours, I was supposed to go to the farm and to the industrial park, but I was so engrossed with, with the activities of the hospital that I said, no, continue to show me, continue to show me, and they were showing me all around. So that is corporate social responsibility in action. That is when you care for your community, you care for the people that reside in your community, and you are not just talking about it, you are actually leaving a footprint where people can actually feel the impact of your institution in their own lives. Okay, so SDGs, I've also told my students that research in Africa these days should not ever be completed without mentioning at least one or two of the SDGs. So if you are conducting research with us, we want to see you speaking about the SDGs because through research, we can help our governments and our leaders to attain the SDGs. All right, so I'm just going to go now to just talk about what I feel organizations should do in order to improve the socioeconomic development of us here in Africa. So my first one is that the S, uh, corporate governance and corporate social responsibility should be embraced in all institutions. So when you are sitting in your Senate meeting even, in management meeting, think about the environment, think about the community, think about what you can do to better the lives of Ekiti State first and Nigerians generally. It shouldn't be an appendage. It shouldn't be a nice to do thing. It should be a strategic board decision. Effective CG and CSR implementation requires top management involvement. Many times our top management will set up a committee, go and find out what we can do for the community so that they will be quiet, so that they will not be agitated. That is not the approach. The approach is it should be a long-term strategy of the organization on what they intend to do for their host communities. Policies of the organizations should be directed to incorporate those things. The budget of the organization should be such that there is a provision for corporate social responsibility. And then you must involve all stakeholders. So we've moved away from shareholder approach to stakeholder approach. Before now, companies only cared about their shareholders making profit, paying the dividends, but we are moving away from that. Your stakeholders are your community, your environment, the climate is your stakeholder, government is your stakeholder, and every other thing that impacts, that your activity impacts becomes your stakeholder. Then we want to move also to the area of measure and evaluate, because one thing about corporations is that if there is no profit, if it's not seen to be beneficial, they're not going to want to do it. So we're saying, why don't, you in, why don't you put measures in place to be able to evaluate if your uh, social uh, development policies are being beneficial to you? You find out that, let's use the Niger Delta, when you invest in, in the community, they allow you to operate, which means you're allowed to generate your profits. The only thing is that you haven't put a, an amount onto the fact that you are being able to operate in peace. But if you do that, you'll find out that it outweighs the actual profits that you are declaring. Then companies should look more towards long-term integrated investments rather than short-term feel-good activities. I've gone around and I've seen boreholes that are no longer working, electricity poles and street lights that no longer work. These are short-term measures. We want you to think more in terms of long-term. Communication is also key. 
you need to communicate to your stakeholders, have an engagement, have a dialogue session with them, bring them to a round table like this and discuss and hear from them as well. Companies should engage in training programs that could help in employment opportunities. We know that in Africa, that is one of our problems, youth unemployment. That also brings me to your vice chancellor. When I was meeting with her this morning, I told her that I noticed that most people in her office and around are young people. And she smiled and she said, that is, that is the aim. We want to give them opportunities. So please, um, upward young staff members, embrace this opportunity and take it. Because for you to be given this opportunity, it's actually a privilege. Uh, if you come to DUT, for example, like I told her, if, if that program, if I, in fact, we do have a program in DUT to train our staff as well, but they are mostly over 40s. They are mostly over 40s. So I was very impressed to see people below the age of 40 in such tra strategic um, areas in Abwad. So well done to Abwad once again. All right, then we cannot leave the government aside. When I started, I, I, I recognized the governance of Ekiti State because I believe that if they didn't create the enabling environment, there wouldn't be an abward today. So government is a stakeholder and they are very important and corporations and institutions and organizations should not leave them out. We should look into what strategy they have and try to also join into that strategy. And also the issue of complying with legislation, codes, regulations, etc. Many corporations, they have a legal department, but the legal department is only there for in case somebody's going to sue them, in case somebody's going to give them trouble, then they bring their lawyers. That should not be the role of a legal department only. A legal department should be there to understand the legislation, the codes, the regulation, and to help the company, to, uh, an organization, an institution to comply with those codes, regulations, and good practices of an organization. All right, so I developed something when I was studying to help, and it was it's from a South African concept. So I'm going to just uh, put up that slide. I call it the CIS conceptual framework. This was my new knowledge to my PhD studies. I always tell my students in PhD, you have to find a new, you have to contribute. You have to contribute to the existing knowledge. You must find a gap when you are, when you are researching. You must find a gap in the existing knowledge and make a contribution. This was my contribution. I called it the CIS conceptual framework. CIS stands for synergy, synergy inclusiveness, and socioeconomic development. Synergy, there must be a synergy between companies, government, and all other relevant stakeholders. As well as synergy between, between corporate governance and corporate social responsibility for effective CSR implementation in order to meet the SDGs um, of, that we all, most of our countries in Africa have signed up to. So synergy just means the coming together they're working together. Inclusiveness, no one should be left out. You must hear from everyone. Let's have the community representatives through the, the, the traditional leaders and other groups. Let's have them, bring them together, have a round table, like I said, like this, on a continuous basis. Let them get involved. Let them have the ownership. Let this institution be owned by the Ado Ekiti people and the Ekiti people and Nigerians and Africans include everybody. That is, that is when it's going to be sustainable. If there is a, a, a way that we can come back 100 years from now, we should be surprised that, wow, Abwad has turned to something else. So through inclusiveness, that can happen. Socioeconomic development. Let us not leave the underprivileged people behind. Um, there's a proverb that says that the rich man can build the wall as high as he wants. The day that those surrounding him that are very poor will jump that wall, he will be surprised. No matter how high you build it, they will scale it one day. So we should never leave them behind. So this was my, and this is the model that I developed as well, where I said that business, government, 
and stakeholders must come together and, and the corporate governance and corporate social responsibility must overlap themselves and then the laws of the land must be uh, brought into alignment with every corporate strategy and with every corporate decision. And then definitely we will still have challenges, but we also have to look at the impact of our act activities on the, on, on, on the other stakeholders, and we have to weigh it to see in terms of dollars and Naira and rands, what actually does it come to? So we have to have a broader vision. And then I try to also uh, look at the positive impact that when we come together, when we synergize, when we become inclusive, when we take the poor into consideration, um, I was speaking to my students yesterday and I told them about writing uh, as a projection, that is you are kind of looking into the future. I said it's going to bring about development, community relations amongst uh, businesses will improve, um, they'll, they'll, this, people will have a stake in the institution, in the company that is uh, around them, there will be poverty alleviation, there will be tr education because there will be avenues for training, there will be more employment, there will be reduction in crime, which is a big problem in all over Africa. And when, for the businesses as well, you have improved labor relations amongst your staff, etc. And uh, good govern corporate reputation, which is very important as well for corporations to have a good reputation. Stakeholder satisfaction, where everybody will be happy, and business sustainability. So that was my um, filling the gap <laughs> in my own research in this area. I want to say a very big thank you to all of you for avoid, uh, availing me of this time. I hope I have been able to um, communicate to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, ma. So we'll give you a seat here because I'm convinced that there will be questions People will have some gray area they want you to shed light on. So we'll give you a seat here temporarily. <clears throat> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, shall we celebrate our guest speaker this afternoon? <clears throat> a round enough. She asked a question, and I was asking myself, do I have an answer to that question? She said she hopes she has communicated. Ma, you have not only communicated, you have communicated effectively well. Thank you so very much, ma. I am sure we are better than where we came in earlier today when the issue of CSR is concerned. As important as it is, and as much as we have been able to drink from her fountain of knowledge and experience, I'm sure there will be some people in the house who have one or two questions to ask. There may be some others that have some gray area they want our sister to shed more light on. Distinguished friends, brothers and sisters, the floor is open. You indicate by raising up your hand, your name, and a few other things about you, then your question. I have the permission of the Vice Chancellor to say that we are not expecting any other person to give another lecture. So your contributions, your questions, as usual, must be inside of 120 seconds. 120 seconds. If I'm right, that amounts to two minutes. Thank you. Question and answer time. You indicate by. Thank you, sir. Please, can you come up? 
the 120 second rule is effectively effective. Can I have a cordless microphone, please, if possible? Uh, permit me to stand on the existing protocol. My name is uh, Dr. Njefu Okidu of the Media and Communication uh, Studies. Uh, the presenter talks so much about the goodness in Abuad. So, so, so much. And I think they are true. They are very true. Uh, but I want her to take talk also what makes DUT very thick in terms of uh, being the fifth in South Africa universities being the first in University of Technology, and so on. Thank you. Yes, I, I think we would better take all the questions so that you react to them all together. Professor Yebisi, please. Somebody will give you a microphone there so you don't have to bother to come up stage. Thank you. Well, I'm Professor Yebisi, uh, the Provost of College of Law. I want to hold brief for my founder. There's something very dear to his heart. I think it's one of those battles he's going to fight before he leaves leave this planet, which is not going to do very soon. Now, uh, when you were reeling out the that framework for the success of uh, the growth of this, uh, or for achieving these SDGs, the first thing you mentioned was the constitution. And you said South Africans are happy with their constitution. Which means the constitution is the ground norm. And if you are happy with your constitution, almost everything is attainable. Fortunately, you are our sister our sister in diaspora. At the other day, you'll come back home. Our constitution, many thinkers like my founder, and I support him, we are not happy with our constitution. And we are thinking and it is true that our constitution is not autonomous, which means the, our constitution isn't our collective will. It was framed and foisted on us. So we are not happy with the constitution. We need a constitution. We're going to sit down and draft together. And then we we'll also one day say we are happy with our constitution. Now, there's this Latin expression, ex nihilio nihili fi, which means There's nothing you can get out of nothing. I doubt it if we we'll still have to do a further research or we need to tell ourselves that. Our constitution as it is may make it very difficult for us to be able to achieve this. Can we have your question, sir? This, maybe you are not listening. You are not listening. <clears throat> Maybe make it very difficult for us to achieve this 
SDG goals, especially with the deadline set, whether 2020, 2030, 2050, 2060, unless we revive back to what our founder has been saying, maybe go back to the 1962, I mean 1960, 1963 constitution. I want to, to look at this and then maybe in addition to seem to be talking about indigenous ways of doing things. Can we have your question, Prof? You seem to be talking about uh, indigenous ways of doing things, and I believe uh, South Africans have a way of. Uh, maybe you are enlightening us a little about uh, uh, Ubuntu. Ubuntu. Thank, Thank you. you. I can see uh, another hand from uh, media and communication. Let's go a little bit off communication. Let's go into engineering. Professor Dada. Please be mindful of the one twenty second. Thank you very much. <laughs> rule. The, my due respect to all here, uh, leaders here present, and the guest lecturer, I thank you sincerely for presenting a wonderful lecture. My question is very simple. You did mention about uh, Europe and America, they have already overcome the majority of the SGC, SG, SGD. And uh, Looking at what your university has achieved in terms of the rating that has taken you to a level, that means you are doing something that is possibly having something to do with the issue of uh, European area-based research. And basically, there is supposed to be an integration between industry, academia, and the government. So I want to ask you, what is the practice in the South Africa that is making the thing to work in South Africa that is not making it to work in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Koye, please. Where's my usher? Young man. Prof, 120 seconds. You are a communicator. You should be able to yes. Good summarize. Afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. When I was when I was coming here, I thought uh, Africa was uh, a native of South Africa. I wanted to ask her about xenophobia in South Africa. But now she's a Nigerian living in South Africa. So she's certainly not part of the xenophobia. My question therefore is, what advice can you give to the young Nigerians who want to migrate to South Africa to eke out a living. We know there are big South African companies here, like uh, ShopRite and all that. But our own boys, they want to go to South Africa to eke out a living as barbers, as uh, mechanics, as peddlers, of phones, batteries, and all that. What is the advice to the young pe uh, people from Nigeria going to the living? Should they go? Shouldn't they go? When they go, what do you advise them to do to survive in a fellow African country which we participated in fighting for their freedom when they were under white minority rule. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I expect uh, questions from our students. Uh, okay. Professor Ujo, please. Here, sir. Here. Here. Osha. I'll come back to you, sir. Professor Ojo, 120 seconds. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, the speaker, the VC, 
and uh, all protocols duly observed. I was just wondering, because when I was listening to the lecture, you showed some of your background compared to South Africa, uh, where people were living in uh, shanty towns, and in Nigeria, uh, the squalors due to pollution. Now, in the past, pre-1963, we had the Constitution, 1960 and 1963 Constitution. Now, we have a new Constitution in Nigeria, which emanated from 1979-1999 Constitution. What is the process that you can advise Nigerians on how uh, we can go back to the pre-1963-60 constitution where regions had control over their resources such that they were able to compete and lots of developments were obvious in those regions unlike now when we have so much problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Joe. Professor Joe is talking about regionalism and restructuring. Yes, sir, I can't see your face. Yes, you are recognized. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Aruleba, Department of Business Administration. My question is about the great governments. Now, Nigeria has suffered a serious problem in controlling the economy of the state. Just like South Africa, thousands of companies have relocated outside South Africa and Nigeria, especially my country, Nigeria. Now, corruption has been identified as a serious Achilles on the development of industries in this country. It has become an uncontrollable uh, disease which is killing industries in this environment. Is there any other way that could be suggested by research that can bring back the lost glory of this country? In those days, we have Levantines, Bata. We have Kingsway, Queensway, everything in Lagos and Ibadan. Today, we have nothing in this country. Everything is dead. Everybody is checking out of this country to other nations. If the system continues, there will be nobody left in this country again in the next 20 years. How can we check that? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Kaf, we have two more, and the two will be from that angle. Yes, sir. The man in gray suit, to be followed closely by my brother I'm in a blue shirt and blue tie. My name is Dr. Olujobi Olushola. Since we know that corporate social responsibility is not enforceable, no, is it justiciable? How can we ensure what can Nigeria adopt from South Africa to ensure that it becomes enforceable, to ensure that Nigeria becomes a better place, considering the oil spillage, pollutions, and all the deleterious effects of the activities of the company in Nigeria? Please educate us more on the legal regime in South Africa. That is helping them to make corporate responsibility work. What can Nigeria adopt? Insights can Nigeria gain from them to ensure it becomes relevant and disabled in Nigeria. Thank you. And finally, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my colleague in blue shirt. And then we pass the microphone to our guest speaker. Thank you. My name is Ashubi Ojo Abayomi, a bus staff. 
My question is actually on corporate governance. Ma, is, are there research being put in place to harmonize the corporate governance goals like we have in Nigeria that has to do with board of directors, assurance, sustainability, transparency, and the likes? Is there a research in place that is putting these goals together to harmonize it such that Africa can have one single corporate governance goal? Thank you. Thank you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Our guest speaker, before I yield the microphone to you, may I, on behalf of all of us, thank you profusely for the beautiful words you have for our founder, for leaving his foot, CSR footprints in Africa. We thank you, ma. Now, for me, I'm going home with the fact that CSR is caring about my community, about caring for people in that community. And I'm sure all of us will go home with that. Ma, you have been asked a series of questions. I'm sure, more than sure, that you are up to the task. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Program Director. And I want to thank um, all the contributors and all those that have asked questions. I must put it out there that I do not have the answers to all the questions, but I can equally make suggestions to the questions that have been posed. First and foremost, let me go to the question that talks about what has made DUT in uh, the past less than 20 years grow so exponentially in academic research to becoming uh, the top 500 university in the world, uh, number one university of technology in Africa and South Africa, number five in, Afri in, in South Africa, and also 10 in regards to citation globally. I'm going to say that the answer to this, even though it comprises very many elements, but I will not take leadership away from it. Leadership is number one. If you do not have the leader that has the vision, that has the strategy, that has the enduring spirit to take you to that next level, no matter the amount of resources that you pour into any endeavor, you will not be able to accomplish it. We in DUT, from the vice chancellor to the uh, directors, to the deputy vice chancellors, to the faculties, all those structures when it comes to research is there throughout, even in the departments. So at the institutional level, we have what is called the higher HDC, higher degrees committee at the international level, I mean, at the uh, institutional level. That is headed by the deputy vice chancellor who reports to the vice chancellor. Even the Senate has an aspect of research which wants to receive research reports every time that they sit from the deputy vice chancellor's office. And then at the faculty level, all faculties have research managers, postgraduate and research managers. And in the departments, we have departmental research committees. So it is in all the structures of the institution. And they are all supported and they are all resourced to be able to achieve the goals that the university has. This cannot be done at the Senate level alone, at the institutional level alone. If you leave out the faculties, you will never achieve it. It cannot even be done at the faculty level alone. If you leave out the departments, you will not be able to achieve it. So all, that is why I talk about synergy. All these structures must come together for you to achieve your one goal for your institution. So in the past 12 years, we've had two vice chancellors, but we made sure that we appoint those ones that have the same vision. You can come with all your accolades, 
But if you do not see that you are aligning with the vision of the university, you are not going to be appointed. We want the vice chancellors that will come and carry forward from what the other one left behind and improve on it. Not the one that will come to start his own thing all over again. There must be continuity for there to be sustainability. And I think that is what is lacking in many institutions. But I go back to Abwad to say that I read and investigated Abwad very seriously. And I have seen that all of their leaders, including the visionary, they all have one mission and one goal. And that is why Abwad has been able to grow so much, which even universities in Nigeria that are very old, much older, have not been able to attain. The next thing is collaboration. We in DUT, we take collaboration very seriously. We are collaborating with very many international universities. And as I told the vice chancellor the other day, that now we are collaborating with our fellow African universities. We have gone into collaboration with various countries in Africa, universities. And we want to share best practices with them. We want to also uh, ha engage in this uh, collaboration with students exchanging um, from one university to the other freely, sharing knowledge, and all of these things. We believe that if we do it in South Africa only with South Africans, we're not going to go anywhere. But when we open up and we allow the international uh, students from all over Africa to see us as a research um, building institution, then we've achieved. And that is number one reason why we've been able to, uh, to grow so much. I hear we have two alumni students here, I don't know if they're here, are they here, who studied in the D uh, Durban University of Technology and have graduated with their doctorate degrees. We, know, we don't leave them alone. We're always sending them emails, we even offering them postdoctoral fellowships that they should come and stay with us and research under us. We offer them affiliations, we appoint them as visiting research associates, visiting research fellowship, uh, fellows, visiting professors, we affiliate with them, we don't, we don't leave them, they don't leave us. They stay with us for the rest of their lives so that whenever they are publishing, they are publishing under DUT affiliation. So it is not you bringing everybody under one roof, but it is you giving everybody the space and the ability to continue to engage with you. So engagement, collaboration is also key in achieving um, this, um, uh, uh, growing your university and your academic environment. So that is uh, the short answer to that question, but there are very many more, which I think I have to also research into it as well. Then with the issue of the constitution, I'm also, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also for decolonization, and I know that some of the students here that join our seminars session in online uh, from here, they always, always hear me speak about decolonization and Ubuntu. You see, xenophobia came from a space where Africans hate themselves, distrust themselves, misconceive themselves, misunderstand themselves and do not value themselves. The philosophy of Ubuntu says, I am because you are. Without you, I will not be who I am. We need to continuously drum this into the ears of our Africans. We are not your enemies, we are your brothers. But you see, apartheid hadn't told them that this color is not a good color. So when they see uh, the foreign black person come into Africa and come into their space, which is South Africa, they're remembering what they've been told. Because remember, they don't even, they don't value themselves because that is what apartheid told them that they are nothing. So it's a complex, very complex situation, which I believe that the ones sitting here, they are the ones that will take the African mind, decolonize the African mind away from that and begin to value ourselves and to see ourselves in the spirit of Ubuntu, that because you are, we are. Nigeria fought for the independence of South Africa. I think they, many banks, union of uh, what, Barclays Bank, 
was nationalized to either Union Bank or First Bank, I forgot which one, because of South Africa. We told them to leave. The Nigerian government said, leave the country because you uh, went into partnership and you invested, you did business with South Africa, which was under sanctions. And that was how Barclays Bank of the UK had to leave Nigeria and the bank was nationalized and became either Union Bank or First Bank, one of them. Please, you, you will be able to correct me on that. But that was the spirit of Ubuntu when we fought for our fellow brothers, when we were heartbroken when we saw the pictures that were coming out of South Africa. But many times the media uh, and how they portray, oh, the foreign African has come to take your jobs. They are more educated than you. Now they've come to take your jobs. These are the reasons why we have things like xenophobia or Afrophobia or any of the phobias that you'd want to call it. So I believe that when we start engaging with the youth at the undergraduate level, postgraduate level, you're going to see that these things will change. And I'll tell you, in the university community, it has changed. I know you see the pictures, you know the media, sorry media, you're here, but you know the media, they'll show you the very ugly side. But if you come to our institution, they hold their hands together, South Africans, other Africans, they are all together in, as one. They share the library, the resources, research together. They, the Ubuntu, spirit of Ubuntu is alive. Just that the media will never show you that side of it. They're always going to show you the very ugly side. But um, in, in, in so much as it is terrible, but I'm telling you that the good is overshadowing that very bad aspect. But I'm happy that the media is portraying it that way because then it brings the government and everybody to be right upstanding and to begin to think about what to do to change it, which is one of the reasons why we are now saying we want to collaborate with our African universities. We've learned a lot from the foreign. We're not leaving it, but we want to also collaborate with our fellow African universities to bring these young minds together as one. Um, why are institutions in SA achieving SDGs? Well, that is also a topic of debate. They are trying, but they haven't also achieved it 100%. We still have a lot of poverty in South Africa. We still have a lot of um, people that have not been able to go to school because of one thing or the other. But I would say that the government is really trying. Um, for example, for university education, they have what is called NESFAS. NESFAS is student loan given to you by the government um, interest-free, whereby the government will pay for you throughout your education, and then when you start your work, you begin to refund to the government. So they pay for the books, the feeding, accommodation, the school fees, everything, and the pocket money religiously without fail to the students provided you are keeping an academic record which you have signed and agreed to you will receive the next fast funding from the beginning of your study period until the end and then you start paying once you start a job so that in that regards i really applaud them for that and i wish that the nigerian government can also do that for students in nigeria migration to sa in 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 our faculty Entrepreneurship is one of the leading um, goals that we are trying to achieve. When I see the founder, I'm going to discuss it with him. We want to set up an entrepreneurship chair, research chair for all African students. We want African students to come together too. Thank you. Under this umbrella, to begin to be funded to conduct research on how we can sustain our businesses. America and Europe, they are what they are on the back of their entrepreneurs. So we need to develop African entrepreneurs. And we would want the founder of Afela Balalola University, after COVID, to come to DUT and to tell us, to share his story with us. How did he do it? So that we, the younger generation in the two countries, can benefit from his experience and how he was able to achieve.
through entrepreneurship what he's been able to achieve. So I believe that migration to other economies, not only South Africa, will only stop once we raise entrepreneurs amongst us who can set up businesses, sustain themselves and sustain their families. So that is one reason. But are you going to migrate to South Africa? I would advise you, please do not, because they have 33% unemployment rate amongst the youth. So where will you fit in? If they cannot employ their own, how will they employ you? So I would say, if you want to come to study, the doors are open for you in that regard. But if you want to come and live and work, um, I would advise, let's be entrepreneur, entrepreneurial right here in Nigeria. You can succeed. You can do it. And social media and the internet has given us a better opportunity as well. I know a lot of South Africans who import um, through, social, through the platforms this fashion from Nigeria and lots of things from Nigeria and vice versa as well. So I think that is also the beginning of, of that. Process on constitutional development. I mean, this is another lecture on its own, but my thought and belief is that you can never develop a constitution without the engagement of the people. That is the only reason why South Africans love their constitution. It, they sat down at every level of structure to speak into the constitution. So the final outcome was something representative of everybody. I don't know if you know that South Africa is the only country in, in Africa that has the issue of sexual orientation in the constitution says there should be no discrimination against anybody, regardless of your gender, age, or sexual orientation. It's the only. And because of that, everybody belongs to that constitution. Whether you, uh, whether you agree with it or not, but there's a space for everyone. And that is the important thing about constitutional development, to create a space for everyone to say, this is me, I can see myself in this book, in this constitution, and therefore it's my constitution. Yes. And then corruption and development. I didn't have time, but it's a big part of my study as well. There can be no development when when there is so much of corruption. Corruption must be eliminated, must be removed from our society, our organizations, our institutions, and even in our minds. The students that are sitting here must remove corruption in every aspect of their lives. Do not copy it. Do not, be happy. Do not even admire people who, who acquire things under corruption. I cannot admire that but rather admire people who succeeded from their sweat. That is what we should, look, uh, we should look towards and encourage. You see that when you begin to shun them and you begin to rather emulate the good things, I know it's not as easy as what I'm saying, but it starts with us, the citizens, and it ends with us, the citizens. Once we rise up together and we say no to corruption, you find out that corruption will eventually Sees. If we cannot uh, eliminate it 100%, we can at least minimize it to at, at least an acceptable level if there's anything like that. But if there was corruption in Abwat here, I don't think I will see all this development because it's only 12 years old. How did they get here? So this is what we should emulate. Thank you. Voluntary CSR and enforceable CSR. Yes, the, the legislation that I put up, even though CSR is a voluntary measure, even corporate governance, but the legislations there, when properly implemented and properly interpreted by our legal luminaries and judiciary, you find out that it is not as voluntary as you think. The Companies Act, for example, gives legal backing to many of these um, corporate governance and, and, and uh, corporate social responsibility principles. We need the legal minds to bring that out. As salient as they are, they should emphasize it to the judges. 
the judges should also emphasize it in their judgment. We don't need to have a legislation that states what you must do, what you must not do. The fact that we have in our legislation things like, for example, you are not allowed to de destroy your environment, that is corporate social responsibility on its own. You don't need a separate legislation. If the company, an Allied Matters Act, or in South Africa, the Companies Act says that every corporation must be mindful of its environment. That is enough. But we, the lawyers, we need to bring that out when we are arguing those cases. We, the researchers and scholars, we need to emphasize that point when we are writing our research publications. And then the issue of uh, corporate governance research to harmonize, yes, uh, some corporate governance uh, legislation for all of Africa. Okay, the goal actually is the same because when I read the corporate governance legislation in Nigeria and that of South Africa and that of Kenya, which I have read as well, they, are, they all have one mission. And their mission right now is that we need businesses that are sustainable and profitable at the same time. Sustainable, mindful of the environment, mindful of the community, mindful of all stakeholders, and also remain profitable, because businesses must be profitable. But you don't have to be profitable at the back and the, and, and the uh, health of others' people. You can be profitable and sustainable without killing all the animals, without destroying the environment, without destroying the future uh, generation's home. This world is the home of the future generation. So if you destroy it now, then where will they live? So we believe that in as much as you want profit, you must do it in a responsible, transparent, and accountable way. So we do have one goal in Africa. We do not need one law. However, I do call upon the, uh, the African Union to take this issue of corporate governance and corporate social responsibility very seriously so that they can continue at their meetings where all the African heads of states assemble to bring these issues out and to ensure that they abide in their different countries to all the charters that the African Union has put forward. I thank you so much and I hope that even though I haven't been able to answer it maybe the way you want it, but I hope that I've been able to communicate my own ideas which I share with you also um, in regards to these questions. I thank you. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, shall we celebrate our friend and sister for that beautiful lecture <clears throat> and for the elucidating way she has answered our questions. Let's celebrate her. She deserves to be so celebrated. Thank you so very much. The guest speaker, ma. Can I ask you a question, ma? When next are you coming back? Thanks so very much, ma. I wish the founder were to be here. There was something you said about the need for a people's constitution which he has been saying consistently and unequivocally since 2001. He gave a lecture in Port Harcourt precisely in year 2001 where he emphasized the need for regionalism, restructuring, and the need for us to go back to 1963 constitution. When the military made an incursion to the governors of this country on June 15, 1966, they said they were suspending the Constitution. And when they were going in 1999, instead of bringing back what they suspended, they manufactured, deliberately I'm using that word, manufactured their own Constitution. Ari Afebala has been saying consistently without any apologies that the problem with this country today is the 1999 military constitution. And until we do that which we need to do, 
go back to the 1963 constitution which was fashioned by founding fathers after meeting for 10 years in Lancaster House in London, we may not get it right. Please, ma, when you see him, I wrote down what you said, that you cannot fashion out a good constitution without the imputes of the people. Tell him, that has been his position. You are on the same page. God bless you, man. In rounding off, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, may I invite the Vice Chancellor to please give the closing remarks. I'm sorry for putting the cart before the horse. It is the horse that drives the cart naturally. Goodwill messages from two people, alumni association. Are you ready? Goodwill messages. Oh, okay, you are from that university. Ah, well, yes, sir. Please come upstairs. Please, sir, the 122nd rule is still subsisting. Thank you, sir. Standing on the existing protocols, I, I am very elated to meet uh, Dr. M.M. here today. Uh, my name is Oyinloye Babatunde Adeyonju, a doctoral graduate of uh, the International, International Center of Nonviolence under Geoff Thomas Harris and Sylvia Kai. And uh, I must commend you and uh, the work you've been doing at DUT. And um, I must also say that um, being to DUT, we've never had any regrets coming to DUT. And the support you give, even after graduating, has been very immense. And uh, we must say congratulations. Uh, we must commend you for that and, uh, and uh, appreciate you for that. And it's also our hope that in our little way, We'll also be able to give one or two things back to DUT as time goes on. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tola Olagunju from Human Nutrition and Dietetics Department. I had the privilege to study at DUT between July 2015 and um, November 2018. I got a doctorate in food science and technology and I was supported fully by Afe Babalaya University. I got a study leave with pay for that period of time. I want to say thank you to Dr. Amem for coming and for your presentation. Um, having gone through DUT for a postdoctoral program, I want to appreciate the university for the support that post, I mean for doctoral program, I want to appreciate the support that I got personally from the university. Um, apart from having the facilities to be able to carry out your study, it's also important to be able to communicate your findings. And this I got a lot of support from the library. There were workshops for research capacity building. There were support for end note reference management. Um, you wanted to get information. The, we had links to databases that supplied information for us that helped our study. And apart from that, from DUT, I was able to go on an exchange program to France for a three-month study at CIRAD. It was partly sponsored by DUT and by Afe Babalala University. And, you know, we also had support for attending conferences both locally and internationally. And I want to say thank you so much. I enjoyed my stay at DUT. I will forever be grateful for the opportunity I had to study there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Our alumni 
from South Africa. Finally, finally, in Radid off, please shall we celebrate the Vice Chancellor as she comes up to give the closing remarks. Professor ABC, please get ready for the vote of thanks. You must agree with me that the two hours and a quarter have just flied by because we were all wrapped in attention, listening to our distinguished guest. First and foremost, I want to appreciate our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Arabs, Professor Damilola Olawi, the Senior Advocate of Nigeria, who made it possible for all of us today to be here. He met some time ago, 2019, I believe, with our distinguished erudite speaker. And ever since, he never gave up until he brought her here. Let us give a round of applause to Professor Damilola Olawi SAN, whose brain, whose initiative is today's program at Abwad. Even though here, he is not here physically, he's very much with us in his spirit, and I am sorry that we could not key into a Zoom room to invite him to be here with us. That being said, thank you very much, Dr. M.M. Anwana, not mm. only a guest, not only a visitor, a friend, not only a friend, and a highly erudite colleague, but as from today, a member of Afeba Balola University family. I want to take the singular privilege on behalf of our chancellor and founder and his very amiable and beautiful wife to proclaim you one of our family members, not extended family, but nuclear family, upward members. You are highly deserving. You state that your visit is an open door opportunity to all of you to study, research, postgraduate training, and so many other opportunities. We thank you. People do not know, you might not know, that the 23 abroad students who are currently benefiting from postgraduate program at DUT are also benefiting from grants from DUT. Let us thank them. Thank you very much. You gave grants to our master's students. You gave grants to our postgraduate students to improve their own researches. We are grateful, ma'am. You set up, you promised to discuss with my fund, our chancellor, to set up a research chair for entrepreneurship here at Abwad to strengthen the Africa's collaboration and the Africa, Africans to set up their businesses. That is looking forward, forward for the current generation to do better than we have done, to have better opportunities for our young researchers. You cannot, you told us clearly, the constitution will come up over and over. You cannot develop a constitution without the engagement of people. Our students here, make sure that you will go for nothing less. My colleagues here, we shall go for nothing less but our constitution. 
So we shall also be happy as the South Africans are happy with their constitution. It is well noted, ma'am. That is the dream of our chancellor and founder too. We have same vision, mission, to engage, engage into collaborative international institution, engage the African institutions. We are all busy looking outside to Europe, America, Australia, but you called our attention. Hello, what are you doing among African institutions with the same vision, mission, and mission? We are ready. We are keyed into the same vision and mission, and we shall help develop the African institutional collaboration will make us better. And the whole world will compete with Africa. Rather than Africa competing with America and Europe, it shall be the reverse situation. Why? Because we have everything we need to be the best. The most important, perhaps, message was passed down to us, the spirit of Obutu in life. You are because we are because you are. Yes, remember this. This is the spirit and this is the philosophy that we shall embrace, all of us. And our founder, Are Afe Emmanuel Babalola, you rightly observed that he is leaving his footprint in the corporate responsibility through his works here in Abwad and beyond. Yes, if we have a philosophy here which is called the aphasm, born from our leader's example. And our leader's dream, that is Are Afe, Emmanuel Badbalola's dream, is that he plants his seed into each and every one's heart, soul, spirit, to carry on the good work that has started here at Afe Babalola University. He tells us, my students, us, that your teachers, your founder, your chancellor, tells us, I caught him, I cannot do it alone. We shall do it together. My students, you shall do it together. You shall change this world to a better place to live in safety, in peace, in harmony, where everybody in the world shall look up to Africa because we are born to live. It is up to us to lead others. Thank you, our distinguished Abad member. You are our family. In fact, your name should change very soon, shall change very soon, shall be added very soon. They are our own baptism, which is part of our culture. Dr. M.M., you, shall, you added not only knowledge, you brought in that spirit, that new spirit to change Africa, make Africa the best of best of the continent. Thank you very much. On behalf of all of us, we are grateful. And as my director of corporate affairs said, we're expecting you not to even leave, not when you are coming back. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, Madam Vice Chancellor, for those beautiful words. Gradually, we are inching towards the end of this program.
to round it all off, may I, with your permission, invite to the podium the Provost College of Law, Professor Tunde ABC, to give the vote of thanks. Well, uh, the Vice Chancellor has done all the thanks, and uh, as Provost, I believe uh, the only thing I can do here is just to conduct the receptional hymn, which is taken from, uh, which is taken as hymn one of Afeism, and you are all going to join in singing this song. Please rise for this song, Recessional Hymn. Except that the, my registrar will not be here with me to lead us, but uh, the hymn taken from uh, our Aphasian Hymn book. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I believe uh, by the time you meet the founder, you know the essence of this song. Thank you very much. The guest speaker, man. Hey, student, wait now. Let our visitor leave the hall. That is the standard practice, please. You remember what she said about you, that she could see discipline. Don't pinch at that, please. Our guest speaker, man. The song that was just rendered by the Provost uh, College of Law is Abuad Him 101. Thank you, man. In writing of the Seguish Legist and Gentlemen, we will be upstanding. We have the university anthem, at the end of which we should please allow our leaders to exit the hall, and then we follow them. God bless you. Technical team, are you ready for me? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, for your patience and for your time. Please, as usual, let our leaders exit the hall and then we follow suit. God bless you all. Have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>